and thanks for being here. Um, your question actually will be answered here, I hope. So um, just introduce myself, I'm Christos Galanopoulos um, and I will introduce everybody else, but my background is I'm actually a surgical oncologist uh, uh, specializing in kind of foregut, pancreas cancers, things like that. I'm also a health economist trained in the UK. Uh, I co-direct our Institute for Health Innovation that you see up there with Joe Jimsky. Uh, and I'm gonna let them take over their introductions real quick and we'll go into what the Healthy Nevada Project was and what was born of it and where we're going because I think it's pretty interesting to address some of the things you're talking about. So this is Debbie Alexander, go ahead Deb. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, so I'm Debbie Alexander, I'm Director of Business Development at 23andMe. Um, I'm a scientist by training. I actually postdoc'd about five minutes walk away here in Stanford. Um, I'm a geneticist by training and now I work on a lot of research and data and population health partnerships at 23andMe. I'm Joe Jimsky. I'm a biophysicist by training. Um, I direct the Applied Innovation Center at the Desert Research Institute, which is a Environmental Health Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. Um, we have projects around the world looking at um, environmental health. I think the question uh, earlier regarding um, fundamental problems that aren't addressed by first world concerns. Um, air pollution is the number three cause of death worldwide still. Um, you don't need a doctor to fix that problem. You need to clean the air. You need to talk to uh, Tesla versus Ford or Mercedes-Benz, I guess, um, and the coal burners. Um, my group uh, takes a lot of data and tries to make conclusions from it. And uh, yeah, extremely relevant to the previous discussions. Yeah, and, and the other thing, if you have questions during this, just scream. I think it's important, obviously, everyone says the same thing, I wanted to be interactive, but really, things that occurred during this event uh, from about a year and a half ago are pretty exciting and it addresses a lot of the issues that have come up in a bunch of different talks here, whether it's patient empowerment, patient engagement, big data, population health, how do we solve problems and what are we doing with that information. So um, quickly, the Healthy Nevada Project, um, uh, started in June of 2016 on a whim. Uh, Joe uh, and I were speaking about uh, what we could do with the data from our health system. So quick overview, Renown Health is the biggest employer in Northern Nevada, it's the largest health system, three hospitals, insurance arm, everything you could think of that's part of a health system. Um, has epic uh, EMRs and the data just sat there. Think of it like a, a farm that no one's picking the fruit. So. That data was moved to DRI, and the reason, and Joe is a little subtle about it, but DRI has been doing environmental research for the last 60 years, predicting weather patterns, bringing ice cores from the South Pole, checking the air quality in China, Mexico City. It's not a little organization. I think where Joe is up north, there's 190 PhDs up there, and then on the south, there's another one. They monitor the Nevada test site where the nuclear things were done. So they're used to doing defense contract work, handling massive data sets and ultra secure. So, the, so at the time we thought, what could we do together? The, through the governor's support of some financing for Joe's group, we decided to move our EMR data de-identified to DRI, build a big firewall so that the insurance companies couldn't get to it, no one could get to it, de-identify de it, and start mining it and seeing what we have. And that's kind of what the Healthy Nevada Project started. From that, the Institute for Health Innovation was born, but I'll get into that later. Um, but there's a term that we use about health determinants and you'll hear about tech, you know, big data solves everything, AI solves everything. I think I've been here for the last four years and heard how I'm not gonna have to call my doctor anymore because AI will solve my problem. And my answer to them as a clinician is when your urine starts burning, we'll see who you call, right? So, <laughs> so the health determinants are a group of different things that make us healthy and not healthy, right? Um, so this is something we put up there and you'll understand what that, why we put that up there. So, you know, sometime in 2050, Nevada is gonna be the healthiest state or state in the, in the country. Uh, and it's all, as much as we like to pat ourselves on the back, it's all because of the AIHI. Um, so um, why, why do we say that? So if we look at Nevada, 
uh, we got problems. I'm from Chicago, Joe's from Jersey. You're from Jersey too, right? Just joking. Uh, so so uh, um, from perspective of cost per capita, so speaking as an economist, the money we spend cost per capita per person is, is goes to healthcare. And as you've heard before, the lower the number, the better, right? So that's, if you're a health economist, if you're spending $3,000 per capita and you're getting good quality of healthcare, that's terrific. The problem is we're spending, you know, 5,700. And, and from a perspective of the United States this year or last year, it's $9,000 per capita. And the thing with the United States healthcare system, and I've studied globally, is that we actually have a great healthcare system. What we have is problems with access and kind of the issues that you spoke about, about how do we uh, make it, it universal standards, quality, things like that. It's not, it's not about being a terrible health system, it's just we have problems. It's, it's very fragmented, it's privately run, you know, publicly run, we have the, the, the Medicare doesn't really communicate with the private insurance companies. We talk about research, all these different things. So that's the challenge with healthcare in the US. But in Nevada, we've, we have big problems. And as you can see, when we look at the US population for heart disease, cancer, and chronic respiratory disease. So we, when you talked about the common diseases, these are the rates that we see in Nevada. And then Washoe County is the county that we're based out of up north. So you could see the disparity in uh, the adjusted death rates. And so when we uh, started this project, we felt, boy, we got a lot of problems here and we got to figure out how to solve it. One way is how are we going to get people involved, right? So when we talk about anything we talk about in healthcare, and, and again, we have a lot of patient advocacy groups, we got physicians up here, scientists, data scientists. Nothing will get done unless you have patient engagement. Doesn't matter how many times, you all know it, you've been screaming, if someone mentioned exercise, you can tell someone exercise a thousand times and they're not gonna exercise. You tell them to stop smoking, they're not gonna stop smoking. So somehow we gotta be able to get patient engagement. And the term, the basic term in behavioral economics, reciprocity, came into our word, in our minds when we thought about what will we do? How are we gonna capture patient engagement? And that was kind of the beginning of our relationship with 23andMe. So, during this work, Joe and the rest of the team there, myself and some people at our health center, we have a cardiologist, we have uh, the head of pediatrics involved, we have uh, our CEO involved, the heads of DRI, the DRI Applied Innovation Center, and 23 million we were working and trying to figure out what are the, term, the determinants of health, right? It's not, we, we always love to put the, the bullet on the genetics, right? And you're, you're both geneticists, so the idea is, boy, we're gonna solve every problem but that's not real and, and that's why we made this project special is that we feel that the framework that we have walking into this earth and this world is our genetics, but everything else impacts it. Just behavior alone, solving behavior problems, changing people's behaviors is literally gonna say 30, 40% on our expenditure in healthcare. If you can convince people to eat healthier, live healthier and be healthy, that's gonna change everybody's mentality and, and also outcomes. So when we look at um, some of the pain points, someone, we had the, the lady from Lilly, Eli Lilly and talking about, we could do all this research when anybody here who's been part of a clinical trial will say, and I've been a PI in a bunch of them, I need 137 patients or I need 300 patients. 300 patients does not solve a population problem. So that's some of the problems. When we look at the second level here, when we talk about, is this a laser? Yeah. Longitudinal studies, right? How do you study someone we always say, if you've got the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, I wanna put you on this drug and see, but what happened to that person five years before, right? Or how about the next five years after the trial's over? Or did they actually respond to any other therapy? Or did they not, or did they get sick? So the idea is, you know, when we talk about value pricing, you'll hear that term a lot nowadays, is how we're pricing insurance companies are coming to you and saying, we're gonna give you a lump sum of money for a value. All these things are economic terms and the quality from the UK, that's how they used to do, I think they still do it that way with regards to health tech ass assessment. And then when we look at the databases that are out there, and I'll give you some examples, uh, and of course you guys scream if you guys wanna scream, um, that big companies, Google, uh, you know, Verily, Alphabet, Grail, everyone's trying to put together databases. And some of the limitations of those databases are having that phenotypic data, the longitudinal data, um, as I was telling a patient of mine it's, uh, who came down here actually to Stanford for care, and we talked about the value of what we're doing up north with regards to this, st these studies is that when someone, a quartenary center like UCSF where, where I used to be at Stanford, 
Harvard, you know, Hopkins, MD Anderson, they get a snapshot in time. They've seen this patient for maybe about a year in their whole lifespan of their disease. They don't know what happened five years before or the five years after. That's where the power of the data is. Also, the social data. Are they people who are educated? Did they get divorced? Did they lose a job? Did they start smoking? Did they become obese along that five-year path? And that's, I think, what's gonna change it. So, when we talk about reciprocity and we talk about patient engagement, the one part of our database, when I get back to the, uh, the, um, the health determinants database, uh, was um, the genetic side. Now, so you understand DRI and Renowned Health are not-for-profits. So every dime that comes in, quote, profit, goes back into the system, opening a new OB clinic, reaching out to a rural area. Renowned Health covers about, I don't know, 88,000 square miles, something like that. What do we cover? The, the area of uh, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania combined, one yeah. hospital. One hospital system. And so every dollar, we have to fulfill that clinic in Elko that, uh, or Tonopah, if you ever heard of Tonopah, where the aliens land. Um, they lost every healthcare provider in that town. And we had to step in and, and supply them with a nurse practitioner, telemedicine, all these things. So every dime goes in. So we, we don't have a bank account to go around and start whole genome sequencing people or even doing exome sequencing. That's expensive. Even though the price is dropping, exomes, what, about 500 bucks, you think? Yeah. So the second part of that is how do we say to a patient, we want you to enroll in this study, but we want to give something back to you because you are going to share your data with us. And that was an idea that uh, if anybody wants to scream, if they've heard of it happen before, let me know, but I don't think it's ever happened in a trial where you actually give something back to that person, the and we call them a participant, meaning they came in and said, you know what, if you want access to my EMR and, and you know, Renowned Health has 70% of the market share, so we've had this epic data for 11 years, how many terabytes? A lot. That's even more than gigabytes. So. Um, I'm a computer scientist on the side. But anyway, so so we thought, boy, people have heard of 23andMe. 23andMe just started a, a new platform, and, and I'll give you a moment to speak about it, too, called the GSR, which is a research platform. And if, has anybody taken the 23andMe test here? Oh, my goodness. Not yet. That's what I like to hear. Anyways, I did it about six years ago. I think Joe did it about six years ago. Um, but we thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to get someone to both be entertained by their genetics but on the back end, we get this data that's, that's uh, what we call a SNP array. And, and Debbie, I don't know if you want to explain it real quick about what's involved in, in the 23andMe uh, SNP array. So we, and we genotype on a, um, we've actually just switched over to the GSA chip, which is a global consortium array from Illumina. And um, it's called the consortium chip because a whole pile of researchers, um, academic researchers, and some company researchers got together and decided, okay, what SNPs would be most useful to have on a genotyping chip that will tell us all about people's health? So we started, we just switched over to that chip um, a few months ago. We also put um, about, so there's 600,000 SNPs on that chip. We have around 50,000 that we customize for the particular products that we're giving people. And then, depending on who you talk to at the company, which of the computer scientists, we can actually impute out to another 13 to 25 million um, SNPs based on that. So we have a lot of SNP data on um, the, the folks in our database. Yeah. As far as I understand, all of them. Yeah. 650,000 plus imputation up to about. Yeah. Yeah, it has whole genome coverage. And the major gene. So when we talk about, you know, BRCA or things like that, um, you know, uh, I don't know, Joe, you may be able to comment on some of the more uh, rare things, the variants that are picked up by the 23andMe GSR side. So, you all right, Joe? He's getting attacked. So, do you want to comment, Joe, on that at all, about the, some of the reasons behind the scenes of, of the 23andMe? Well, I, I guess the anybody who, who knows anything about genetics um, knows that there's there's ways to go wide and there's ways to go deep. Um, and, and, and the trade-offs are, are based on cost, the questions you're trying to answer. Um, and, and so 
our intent with with working with with 23andMe was that they had just implemented this genotyping services for research platform, which allowed researchers access um, to the data that they were collecting for their interactive um, trait, wellness, and ancestry platform um, as a way of giving back to the participant relevant information and, and information that um, we felt uh, the, the FDA would allow 23andMe to start revealing more and more to the participant. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Debbie, but um, I, I think most recently the FDA has allowed 23andMe to talk about risk for Parkinson's disease and late onset Alzheimer's. And, and I suspect down the line we'll start learning more about, um, about things like um, risks for cardiac disease, um, as an example, um, and other um, polygenic risk factors that can be derived from um, data as we're able to um, impute more and more across the genome for various subpopulations of individuals. Um, for better or for worse, Northern Nevada is a very homogeneous population. Um, largely Caucasian and Hispanic. Um, so those are our two major populations that we need to deal with. Um, we also have the fifth largest Native American population in the United States, um, and then um, very low all other populations, um, Pacific Islander, um, Asian, um, Black and African American. So our focus is, is um, on diversifying the, the type of healthcare and information that we can use, particularly um, to the Hispanic population, knowing that most of the genetics that have occurred are, are on CEU populations. Um, the, the imputation and the, the, the genetics that can be done on, on the um, Illumina array span the entire um, genome. There's some regions with less coverage. Most of them are non-coding. Um, uh, but for the purposes of deriving information on risks with the population, um, the trade-off to, to going deep was that we could save money and um, use this interactive platform for, um, for the individuals. Yeah, and so I want to get back to the term reciprocity. So the idea that, you know, this is something that you buy, you see it online, you buy it, you do it, you send it home. Um, probably everybody in here can afford to do that at a $200 or whatever the price is. But in our population in Reno, around our health center is some of the most impoverished areas. And our idea, if we approach it more on a behavior side, we had three questions to ask. One was, if we offered it for free, would everybody take it? Who would take it? Would, it? would someone who's below the poverty line come and take that test? Second thing is if they took it and they learned risk factors, would they change their behavior? And number three, if we did change their behavior, could we build an economic model behind it to show that this $200 test has a quality that's through the roof and the state should pay for it because it's engagement. It's not about, I found out, you know, my, my pee smells because when I eat asparagus, it's more about now I'm in tune to my own health. I'm interested in my own health. So the plan was to launch this 5,000 kits. So we got some money from our foundation. We bought 5,000 kits in partnership with 23andMe. There was a big, a big uh, event occurred. And we actually felt, boy, we think we could probably do this over three months, meaning we could enroll 5,000 people in three months. The, the uh, Healthy Nevada Project got launched, and in 18 hours, we had enrolled 5,000 people. So we said, holy cow, what do we do? So we said, let's, let's get another 5,000 kids. And thankfully, you know, Ann Wojcicki, the founder and CEO of 23andMe was actually there. Uh, it was pretty exciting. And, and so, you know, on a handshake, we bought 5,000 more kits. We launched that and in 24 hours, those got filled up. Yeah. So great question. So what we ended up doing, Joe and his, supercomputer team developed to use a software to schedule. So the idea was there has to be some quality control, right? We, we don't want just to send kits out to people's homes and then they disappear. We, we've, we've paid for the kit. Again, resources are limited. So actually for the uh, retrieval specimen, we actually did it on site. 
everybody who signed up had to come to our facility to do this, the spit. And we had a really fun setup set up and we had stations and we had an introductory videos. We had people explaining the consent. Within this process, they consented for us to be able to contact them again and research their data, meaning their EMR, the phenotypic data, their social data, all de-identified. So, uh, and then we ended up having 14,000 or 4,000 extra people on a waiting list. And the most interesting thing about this event was that we, patient zero or patient one, whatever you want to call it, it was the governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval. He was actually the first one to take the spit test. And that's him in the picture up there. Good looking guy right there. Uh, these are all community members who are well known in the community, whether they're bloggers, whether they're uh, on social media, maybe they're an actor, or maybe they're someone in the community who works at the rodeo. So we thought we'd get 23 well-known people in Nevada, and they were the first 23 along with the governor. And as you can see, um, we still have 4,000 people. We actually had to stop at 4,000 because I think we broke the internet. So it was uh, it was pretty fun. Um, I'll just, the, sorry, I'll do this real quick, a little summary of it. On the this video. is one of those days where we'll look back and say, that was it. This was a day that we changed this community, we changed this state, we changed this nation, we changed the world. And I have been waiting for this moment now, I feel like, for 16 years. This study is important because not only will it provide direct-to-consumer genetic testing that allows them to understand how to modify their behavior over time and reduce their health risk profile, this is a way of practicing in Nevada that other communities can learn from. We will not only learn more about ourselves, but join a community of motivated individuals who can collectively impact research and contribute to our basic human understanding. The key to our future is what we've come to realize is it's not just about health care, it's about health and well-being. And it's not about patients, it's about people and how we help people to live healthier lives. The study is a pilot, but we're going to build the infrastructure to extend population health and so at the biggest level, we're hoping to discover things here about an approach that a health system can make in the community and allow all Nevadans' care to be improved and other communities around the country where they may be able to learn and apply this approach for the people that they serve. As a surgical oncologist and a health economist, and having taken the 23andMe test, I can tell you that that has led to my own personal behavior changes. Understanding what my genome showed or my risk factors and tying it to my everyday life made a huge difference in myself and my family's behavior. Everyone who participates in this project is going to be setting a standard for the entire world. Please join us as we take the first steps toward a future where access to your personal health data will contribute to a higher overall quality of life for our great state. Joe, you had a comment? Well, uh, I guess two comments now. Um, it helps to have a good marketing department um, <laughs> when trying to engage people. But um, re regarding the, the photograph earlier of, of engaging um, people in the population, we found that, um, w well, we asked 23 number chosen, obviously, um, given the number of chromosomes, um, 23 ambassadors to the community um, were chosen to uh, represent um, the first people in the study, and they were asked to participate based on on the fact that they were community influencers, and um, they they represented the diversity of uh, all that goes on in in northern Nevada. So. You know, one of the tribal leaders was asked to participate and willingly did so. Um, the, you know, the person who wrote the Nevada Moms blog, which apparently like 20,000 moms read, um, participated and talked to um, her sphere of influence. And, and that communication strategy for talking to people um, is way better than having a bunch of overeducated doctors and, and professors um, wax poetic about why genetics um, and and sharing your EMR is um, useful for the population. Um, as well, having the governor 
talk openly about his participation. I, I think those types of communications are um, really important when in asking people to in, in trust in you, the, the data they're giving you. One thing was that the kits were actually given for free. So the access was to everybody. The important thing is that we are the not-for-profit. So we actually had to fly out our team on an airplane to do the kit testing it's remotely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, uh, oh, of course, there. I think there are barriers. I mean, people down the street here can't come to Stanford, right? So, I think that's a that's a great a great point is that access is incredibly complicated because, especially in rural Nevada, I mean, we're literally talking. I see patients from 400 miles away right. with pancreatic cancer. Fortunately, Renown Health is a not-for-profit institution. Last year, we gave out $90 million in free care, and it was whether we flew doctors there or drove them in. No one gets turned away for care at our institution. It's the perfect segue because now you have two not-for-profit institutions having pulled this off. So it was, it was DRI, which is not-for-profit, Renown Health is not-for-profit, partnering with a for-profit company. I, again, I don't... I haven't seen it happen anywhere else. But part of that access is getting that patient interested in coming in or going to the rural clinic that's, you know, maybe a mile away or maybe even in their town. It's about patient engagement. You're not going to solve anything. And Joe made a good point about I could sit on a soapbox and tell everybody stop smoking or stop drinking because you're going to end up with a liver cancer that I'm going to have to operate on or something. It doesn't matter. I mean, we had the last speakers talk about the patients, how, how she felt, right? Getting engaged in your own care, taking some ownership in their, their own care is incredibly important to turn this around. This is just a, one of the tools. And you had a question, I think? So exclusion criteria was you had to be over 18, right? I think, Joe, it was from a consent uh, perspective, a legal perspective initially for the pilot study. And our distribution, Joe, do you want to talk about that? Um, so this was... There was no purpose to the sampling of the population. It was, uh, it was a pilot, and uh, the 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 first question that that Christos um, said was, would people participate if they were for, given away for free? Versus the, the the majority of people that are probably in in twenty three and Me's database are, are paying for it. I, right. I don't know if you, what's the percentage that who haven't paid? Very few. Very few. So the first question was, would the underserved participate in, in, um, in the, the study? And the answer was yes. The, the population from the perspective of, of those who lived um, below the poverty line was just in line with the, the general population. Um, Many more women participated than men. Um, and the, the reasons for that, depending on which studies you look, but um, uh, social science and psychology related clinical trials are normally easier to enroll women. And um, physical studies, um, prob probative studies, um, are, it's normally easier to enroll men. Um, most of the, the the spots for the the uh, the consenting and the education process this was really important um, were during the day and um, at the time uh, the economy was on the upswing but there are many more um, employed men in northern Nevada than women so you can go through the exercise and say um, and and more white than Hispanics enrolled based on the demographics. Um, we purposefully did target the rurals to ask if we went out to rural Nevada and we had 23andMe kits, would people show up? And the answer w was the same as, as the um, 10,000 people who enrolled in, in 48 hours and broke our internet. Um, so moving forward, um, our intent is to expand this study, um, we would start purposefully sampling and, and really targeting um, 
to, to balance out the population so that it truly is, is population health. Um, we also survey our, our population beyond what 23andMe does, and we ask people questions like, um, had you been to your primary care doctor in the last year? And you can look at guidelines and say, based on the age of the respondents, whether they should have been or not. And then we can ask, given this new information, asparagus smell in your urine or otherwise, did you change your behavior and decide you needed to go to the doctor? Um, and, and then build a model about how to give better care, particularly to the rurals, based on the answers to this question. By no means do any of us think that genetic information is going to change people's behavior any more than getting on a soapbox is, but it, it gives you an engaging platform and, and we've heard, you know, incredible stuff about, you know, obviously people who are adopted are particularly interested in their ancestry. And so a lot of people who were adopted showed up. Um, people who have always had the, you know, joke in the family about where they really were from. And uh, Dr. G has has a great story about, about his, yeah, his nurse. Uh, my nurse in the OR who, who has been with me about three years, she's Korean and she is stubborn. And uh, we joke around in the OR, it's your Korean side. She took the test and she found out she was Japanese. <laughs> More so than Korean. She had a little bit of Korean in her. So it was really funny to, uh, to have that happen, but it was that engagement. She's really interested in her care. Debbie, you were gonna say something? Sure. Um, access is a really great question. It's something we think a lot about at 23andMe because, and it's kind of one of our core missions because we are a direct-to-consumer company. So um, I, we believe that telling people, telling our customers what's going on with their genetics is a really um, great educational opportunity for them and will also start engaging them in their health. And so maybe if they don't have access to great health care, I mean, that slide that Christos was showing, I think, is really telling that almost 70% of your, your health and longevity is your behaviors, not so much your access to healthcare. And so we start by telling people kind of fun facts about themselves, things they can see in the mirror, like you have blue eyes, you have blonde hair, but it's all part of education and keeping people interested in themselves and interested in their health. And there's a big like, social aspect to it as well. You know, you can connect your account to other people's. You can see, um, you know, how your genetics compares to other people's. And we now have a genetic weight report, for example, that tells you you're pre genetically predisposed to weigh um, more than people with the same genetics as you or less than, less than people with the same genetics as you. And then we kind of take it a step further because we've surveyed all those people. And so we're able to pinpoint for people, okay, so your genetics says you should weigh about the same as average, but actually you weigh more. Well, here's the like top tips and secrets of other people who've been in your situation have used to lose weight. Because in some situations, it's eating less red meat. In some situations, it's exercising more. And so in this way, we're really trying to engage people and educate them more. I mean, we tell them about a lot of other serious health conditions as well, but just trying to get at that baseline and encouraging people to look after themselves better and, you know, have these dialogues with their doctors is something we're um, really passionate about. Yeah, question. You just define reciprocity. And it's not a financial. Right, we're working on that. That's a good point. And just so you... <laughs> a few years. Oh, is that right? Where do you live? Me too. Oh, I'm at Somerset. I live right down the street from you, so you got to come by. Oh, that's great. Oh, really? Excellent. 
Excellent. You That's should great. join the study. But again, so so what do we do, right? We have these two organizations. We have this data. What we thought, boy, if we could scale this up, and that was the beginning of the Institute for Health Innovation. That's a partnership. It's a third company that's, again, not for profit. So the idea is that we're not profit driven. We're going for um, understanding health and changing population health. Again, interesting, you know, about the, the, the Reno di uh, uh, demographics, closed community, six months of the year, no one goes over the hill. Uh, family after family, we have towns with like five last names. Uh, and so it's a really nice place to study population health. There you go. Right, and there you go. This is some of the reasons why you could do that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Nevada's pretty isolated. Uh, again, renowned health, as he mentioned, has about 70% of the market. We talked about the components of the health determinants. Um, we don't think that's the only, you know, just genetics nor phenotypic data. It's combining them all into a database. The database that we moved to DRI initially, 1.6 million patient records, so fairly high numbers so that we can actually do some large studies. Um, you see 15 million diagnoses, 122 lab orders, and it keeps growing. We had another 200,000 patients this year. Um, the leadership team, I'll get through this real quick. If other people have any questions. And I can tell you just from our discussions with other people around in both health tech, yourself, people studying mesothelioma, people studying uh, genetics of, of opiate abuse and, and addiction, have all come to us and asking us to partner with them to talk about doing this research, being able to study this longitudinally. Person who's on, you know, stuck on oxy, his genomics. What was he doing the last five years? What's he going to do the next three years? You know, and how do we change that? But again, getting back to your initial question about what are the big problems, right? Cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease. You get rid of those, you've just cut the de the, uh, the expenditure in about two thirds. Um, won't go into that, but some of the market space, what's happening out there, these huge partnerships, Geisinger, Regeneron, Decode, Amgen bought that database, huge money that's putting into this. Most of these are lacking the phenotypic data that goes out and continues to grow so that you can follow longitudinally. We kind of looked at our own data. How much did it cost to acquire patients? If you talk to, uh, she's not here anymore, the pharmaceutical person, people are spending five, $6,000 per patient to acquire them just to enroll in a trial. And we're finding that our costs are incredibly low because we're not for profit, right? We don't, we're not charging excess money for that. Um, kind of the things that we're, we're in the midst of, of studying from the economic modeling, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say my alma mater in, in, in the UK, the London School of Economics is interested in partnering with us. Uh, that we, we met with the Welcome Trust uh, in June. Uh, we met with the Gates Foundation. All these people are, are, are fascinated what we pulled off. Saying that, and actually the guys at the Welcome Trust were just like, hey, you guys pulled it off. How, and it was about the reciprocity. It was about giving something back to the patient that, um, I mean, you can give them their genome, right? What does it mean, right? So, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's an, a challenging um, problem, right? Sending them more information about you know, what's happening in the community isn't gonna cut it. Eventually they're gonna get bored. Um, people need, you know, we need the fidget spinner of interactive health. <laughs> um, and part of partnering with a, a company that is invested in continually engaging in the, in the statistics of the interactions with individuals on the 23andMe platform over a long period of time what was one of the compelling reasons why we, we, we chose um, to work with 23andMe was that they're constantly doing research and re-engaging their population. And so as a subset of that platform, that's one way of engaging them. I think we need to periodically make breakthroughs based on what we're doing to continue the trust that people have entrust, put in us. Um, so, you know, for example, we're, Reno has at times some of the, the worst air quality in the United States. Um, you know, literally the worst at times. Fire, inversions, all sorts of um, topographic and, and um, weather related stuff. And so we, we've 
started assessing people in the population that are affected by that. So now we're rolling out a program where we can inform people who have acute problems with asthma and let them know, based on our predictions, when the problems are going to occur and engage them in ways that are going to help their health. And I think you need to just keep doing that and innovating. The innovations don't have to be billion dollar startups. They need to be ways to engage people to say, you know, hey, we, we, we recognize from our model that um, there, there's not great care out in Tonopah from the perspective of, of cancer follow-up. So the hospital now has taken that data and is, is building new, a new care model in Tonopah. And j just continuing to do that becomes um, important. Um, I, I want Debbie to just explain just some of the fascinating statistics behind the engagement of their population, keeping in mind that 98% of them have paid for it. But I think as you engage people who can't afford these types of things, um, that they will become equally engaged. Yeah, the engagement figures are pretty astounding. So we were looking the other day, 23andMe has been around for almost 11 years. So back in 2007, we had 1,000 customers. Now we have 2.5 million. But back when we had 1,000 customers, we looked and in the last 90 days, almost 60% of those original 1,000 customers have actually logged back in to um, find out about themselves. People love knowing new things about themselves. And so we keep sending them um, new reports. Every time we use, um, we use their data to come up with a new report, whether it's about asparagus pea, whether it's a lot more serious health conditions like Parkinson's. We just launched a new report on uh, macular degeneration. And so a lot of people log back in to see that. The other thing we do to keep people really engaged is, it, we tell them how we're using their data and how it's helping other people. Because that's why people are joining these studies, because they want to know that they're making a difference, that their data is really helping. And so every time we put out a publication, so this was a pretty big week for us. We had two publications, one on preterm birth in New England Journal of Medicine and one in Nature Genetics on Parkinson's disease. And so we contact all those people whose data we used and we say, look, look what your data did. And, you know, this is really powerful and really um, interesting to people. And also we have the ancestry piece. So that's something that's um, super engaging to people. They, they want to know what their background is. And as more and more people join the database, they get new DNA connections. So we can actually connect them to relatives that they may never know that they have. And I think that's one piece that um, you guys have been finding has been really interesting for folks. Not only the health piece, but finding out um, where you've come from. You want to answer Joe on the genetic side? Uh, or the other question? Yeah, so um, remarkably, um, d despite um, the, the the gaps between you know the haves and the have-nots. Um, greater than ninety percent of of Nevada is connected um, and has access to um, the the digital world, and so we we aren't reaching at least ten percent or or around ten percent of the population because unfortunately you need an internet connection to um, register for 23andMe, but to, to follow up with 23andMe and access all that incredible information that Debbie says you need to be connected. So that 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 is a problem, um, but even, even so, 30% um, um, of our population of the first 10,000 um, live in households that are below the poverty level. So that's, that, that's good. Um, it's not good that they live below the poverty level, but it's good that they're engaged. You can start to get at, is there a difference between you know, the CEU population versus you know, the, the, the people from Decode in, in Iceland versus, um, I don't think they were involved, but um, another group published um, uh, about uh, populations in, in Malta and on a Greek island and rare variants there. Um, of course, we are doing SNPs, so rare variants are much more difficult, but does the GWAS study for 
cardiac risk score match for the subpopulations in Nevada. And it's just incumbent upon us as scientists to continually reevaluate it. I'm confident in saying that the types of behavior changes we're asking <laughs> are right. only beneficial to people regardless of risks, but how to, um, how to, for example, tell a healthcare CEO that you want to study um, a population that you think has a greater genetic risk for cardiovascular disease um, and dealing with the ramifications of that for, for sure are, are important as you start implementing it from the healthcare system. And we're so early days in doing that. Um, you know, similarly as, as um, the American Cancer Association, you know, making new recommendations on screenings because of the negative consequences of screening just as much as the positive consequences. Um, it's kind of a crap answer, I know, but um, we're, it's, it's, it's tough.